Good morning, Cree Church. My name is Jonathan Womack. I'm an elder here at Cree Church, and I'm preaching in our pastor, Brett Revlitz's absence. It's awesome to be with you. And to begin, our call of worship is going to come from Psalm chapter 66, verses 1 through 2. Psalms chapter 66, verses 1 through 2. And the reading is this. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for an opportunity for us to get together virtually through our TVs or our computers or our cell phones. But we are bonded together as a community of believers to come and give you praise and worship. We ask that you be with us as we go through our sermon and that you transform us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. sisters, this is such a wonderful time that we have in our service where we get to profess our faith with one another. So what will happen, I'll ask the question, and then if you can, with me, with us, uh, that we can joyfully answer this to the God who is with us right now. 
into what state did the fall bring mankind? And let's say this together. The fall brought mankind into a state of sin and misery. But brothers and sisters, the good news is that we did not stay in that misery. Because of the grace and mercy of our Father, he sent his Son to this earth to die on a cross for our sins. And because of that, we have a relationship with the, with the Father. So let's praise Jesus Christ for what he had done on that cross and what he continues to do in our life as we sing this next song, Nothing But the Blood. What? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood. Brothers and sisters, this next song we will sing is based on Psalm 121. And the psalmist voices these words. Where does my help come from? And I'm sure maybe some of us are there right now or have been at some point. But asking the question, where does my help come from? But the good news is that our help comes from the Lord. In verse 7 of that same psalm, he said, the Lord will keep you from all evil, he will keep your life. So let's praise the Lord as we sing this next song, I Lift My Eyes Up. I lift my eyes. I lift my eyes up to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from you, maker of heaven, creator.
I lift my eyes. I lift my eyes up to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from you. Yes, it does. Maker of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we just sang this song about lifting up our head. And because of our sin nature, Lord, our our head has this tilt down, but it is by your grace, Lord, that you pick up our head and you say, come to me. You are life, Lord. So I pray that as we are about to hear the preaching of your word, Lord, that you give us that life, that life that is in your holy word. Lord, we praise you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for you are an amazing God. And you continue to love your covenant people. Thank you for all who you are what you're done, and what you're going to do again yet someday, Jesus, when you come riding in on the clouds in glory. What a, what a wonderful day that's going to be for all who believe in your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all these things, and we, and we, bl- and we pray this in your name. Amen. Now turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Genesis chapter 4 verses one through eight. And my sermon is titled, The Jesus Pattern. The Jesus Pattern. Please follow along with me as I read out loud. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've begotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel 
and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, how it guides us, confronts us, and points us to your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that you use me as an instrument to do the same thing. May you be glorified through the proclamation of your word today and everywhere amongst the nations. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, before we begin, it's helpful to point out that there are certain parts in the Bible where the author does not give us insight into the characters' minds or their motivations. A good rule of hermeneutics, that is the method by which we read the Bible, is to recognize these times and resist the urge to read into the text our own non-biblically supported thoughts. This is a very, very difficult task, especially when the goal of reading the Bible is to learn about God and how we should live in light of what he is doing and what he has done. If you're taking notes, just know that I've broken down today's text into three sections. I'm going to explain the text. I'm going to show the centrality of Jesus and then help us apply what this story means in our lives. Now, let me begin by explaining the text. Within our text, we have three sections that I have labeled the boys, the offerings, and the reactions. The boys, the offerings, and the reactions. Throughout each section, I want us to focus on how God is introducing to us the Jesus pattern. And he's showing us that Jesus is the promised seed that we need. Jesus is the promised seed that we need. Well, let's look at the boys in verses one through two. Prior to chapter four, the only people of which scripture speaks are our first parents, Adam and Eve. In chapter three, we learn that Adam and Eve bought into the lie that they could be like God by defying God's commands and breaking covenant with him. You remember eating from the forbidden tree? See, Adam and Eve committed high cosmic treason against the king of the universe by eating from that tree. Our, our covenant breaking with God is the reason why, as Genesis 3 says, the whole world is cursed. Not only is the world cursed, but we human beings as God's image, image bearers are cursed. And then we're cursed because of the sin that we inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve. The curse bears itself out in many ways, stemming from the tragic events that we witness in nature, all the way to the evil that we see on television and even witness in the deep, dark recesses of our souls. But in Genesis 3.15, in what theologians call the first gospel, God revealed to us how the wrong that we committed will one day be made right. Genesis 3.15 tells us that Eve's male offspring will deal a fatal blow to the head of God's enemy and ours, the serpent, also known as Satan. Now, Adam and Eve were then evicted from the only home they knew. With the shame of sin on their face, the garments of skins on their back, a series of curses, and the promise of redemption through childbearing. Chapter four begins with Adam and Eve getting right to having babies to experience the previous promised salvation from Eve's male offspring. So Moses, the writer of Genesis, introduces us to Adam and Eve's two boys, Cain and Abel. Moses tells us their birth order. Cain was the firstborn and Abel was the secondborn. Moses also tells us their jobs. Cain was a farmer, Abel was a shepherd. At Cain's birth, Eve declares in verse one, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. She later gives birth to another son, Abel. 
Now, it certainly would not have been unusual for Adam and Eve to think that perhaps one of their male children would be the promised seed that we need to bruise the serpent's head. Remember God's promise in Genesis 3.15? Perhaps salvation had come through one of these two boys. Nevertheless, Moses tells us in verses 3 through 4a that the two boys each made an offering. Now, Scripture is silent as to why the two boys would make an offering or if it was even customary for them to do so. However, we can faithfully surmise that Adam and Eve would probably have shared with the boys how they received their garden parton gift, the garments of skins. Remember the garments of skins? In their ignorance and shame, Adam and Eve sought to cover their newly perceived nakedness by sewing together fig leaves. This was the work of their hands. God in his infinite wisdom replaced Adam and Eve's best attempt of a cover-up by clothing them with garments of skins. An innocent animal's blood was shed in order for the garments of skins to be made. By innocent, I mean that the animal was not a part of Adam and Eve's offense against God. Remember Adam and Eve when they ate from the tree? That was their offense. That's what sin is. Sin is an offense. It's an offense against God. Adam and Eve's offense naturally led to the displeasure of God. And this is something that Adam and Eve experienced for the first time time in their relationship with God. After all, this is a book of firsts or beginnings. That's what Genesis means, beginnings. So God's displeasure led to a separation between himself and Adam and Eve. And God's displeasure was not only evident in Adam and Eve's eviction from the garden, but in their newfound shame and their nakedness. Well, what does God do? In his creative power, he brings out the new garments of skin's fashion line. Adam and Eve's clothes will forever be a reminder of God's displeasure of their sin against him. Now the idea of getting back into God's good pleasure is embedded deep into man's conscience and likely transferred to their children. Hence Cain and Abel's desire on a Tuesday afternoon to offer a sacrifice to God. So Cain is a farmer in his offering. He brought the fruit of the ground. By fruit is literally meant the produce of the ground. Abel, as a shepherd, he brought God a sheep of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. So let's take a quick aside. As New Testament Christians, we are privileged because we have access to the New Testament. So another rule of hermeneutics is to read the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. The New Testament, to the, the New Testament letter to the Hebrews tells us how God used the shedding of innocent blood through animal sacrifice to illustrate how sins are forgiven. As Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Later in chapter 10, verse 4, the same author tells us that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Do we have a contradiction? Of course not. The innocent shedding of blood from those animal sacrifices were actually examples of Jesus Christ and his innocent blood, which would one day be shed on the cross for his covenant people. Jesus' blood do does what those innocent animals could not do, namely take away the sin of the world. Jesus is the promised seed that we need. So Abel unknowingly is on to something. Scripture tells us that Abel offered the firstborn of his flock. The firstborn is a term that's unique to Jesus, especially in the New Testament. Um, throughout the New Testament, Jesus is described as the firstborn of creation the firstborn of many brethren, and the firstborn of the dead. Abel's offering was of epic proportion as seen in God and Cain's reactions in verse 4b through verse 8. So in these set of verses, we have three reactions. We have God's reaction to the boy's offerings. 
We have Cain's reaction towards God's reaction. And then we have God's reaction towards Cain's reaction. Try saying that really fast 10 times in a row. So let's first start with God's reaction to the boy's offerings. In verse 4b, we see that God had regard for Abel and his offering, meaning God, in a way, looked towards Abel and said, well done, my son. Abel had experienced God's seal of approval. In verse 5a, we learn that God had no regard for Cain's offering, meaning God looked away from Cain and his offering, and he ignored it. Cain had experienced God's seal of disapproval. God is now, for the first time, showing that an offering is appropriate and what kind of offerings he does and does not accept. In this act, God is showing that he will not accept any kind of offering. We're going to come back to this later. God must approve of the offering. In this, God is continuing the Genesis 3.15 Jesus pattern, And he wants us to see that Jesus is the promised seed that we need. Now let's look at Cain's reaction to God's reaction. Scripture tells us that God's rejection towards Cain and his offering made Cain very angry and his face fell. The King James Version eloquently renders this verse as Cain's disposition being very wroth along with a fallen countenance. The word angry in the original language simply means to be hot or furious. A fallen face is a phrase that suggests one's feeling of rejection or disapproval. So we have an interesting word play at work here. Earlier I said that God's regard is like making eye contact with another person, while God's no regard is like someone who won't make eye contact with another person. It's all about connection. God's lack of face-to-face connection causes Cain's face to fall. At what time or another, I'm willing to bet that we have all experienced furious anger and the feeling of rejection or disapproval. There is a human element that all of us can relate to in Cain's reaction. It would not feel good to present a gift to someone only to have that gift rejected, while another person's gift, which in your eyes is of equal or lesser value, is accepted? Try having your gift rejected by God, the universe's creator. You see, Cain presented the work of his hands in offering the fruit of the ground, just as Abel did with his flock. So one cannot make the claim that Abel's uh, job as a shepherd was any better than Cain's job as a farmer because God gave their father Adam both the garden to tend and the animals to tame. So the moral of the story here is not that shepherds are better than farmers. Rather, the moral of the story is that God is setting the Jesus pattern. God is being consistent in showing us that Jesus is the promised seed that we need. Now let's look at God's response to Cain's reaction, verses 6 and 7. The first thing to note is that God comes to Cain. Cain doesn't go to God. God comes to Cain. This is a trend that God showed earlier with Cain's father, Adam. When Adam sinned against God, Adam hid from the all-seeing God. And he hid because he was afraid. So God sought out Adam. And this is a hallmark of God displayed in Jesus, as Jesus says of himself in Luke's gospel. The son of man has come to seek and save the lost. Now, just one chapter later, God is going after Cain. Why are you angry? Why is your face falling? God knows why Cain is angry just as he knew where Adam was in the garden. Nothing catches God by surprise. Rather, the question is to point out to Cain that the expression on his fallen face looked as if he was going to commit 
a fallen act. So God then warns Cain as he warned Adam that there would be consequences to his actions. You see that in verse 7a. Doing well would have the consequence of Cain's face being lifted up or accepted, as our translations say, just as Abel. For Cain, as one commentator states, doing well would be if Cain retraced his steps, if he considered his ways, if he found out just where he went wrong. Cain did not consider the relation in which he stands to God as a sinner, as the commentator continues, whose life is forfeited and to whom the hand of mercy is held out. And accordingly, Cain has not felt this in his offering or given expression to it in the nature of his offering. Not doing well in verse 7b has its own set of consequences, namely making way for sin. Sin, which is depicted as a crouching beast ready to pounce on its prey, would look to exert its rule over Cain. God knew it. Cain knew it. God tells Cain what he must do in response to the sinful feelings of anger, rage, and disappointment. Rule over it. Rule over it, Cain. Well, did he? Verse 8 tells us that Cain did not. Instead, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So just how central is Jesus in this story about sibling rivalry? Well, if you think this story is about a sibling rivalry, then you are clearly missing the point. The story is about Jesus and the pattern of redemption which was to come. Jesus, the Christ, is the Genesis 3.15 promised seed. He's going to crush the head of the serpent. It wasn't Cain, and it wasn't going to be Abel. But just how would Jesus do this? He did this by living a life of perfection according to God's standard. Remember from the Cain and Abel story, God is the one who's calling the shots. God is the one who determines who is acceptable and who is not acceptable. Jesus is called the Lamb of God without spot or blemish, or in other words, perfection. Remember at Jesus' baptism, what were the words that God uttered? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus received this from God before his earthly ministry even began. So then Jesus, as our high priest, he pays for our sin debt with his perfect life and becomes not only the offerer of the sacrifice, but he is the offering as a sacrifice. That's Good Friday, that's what we celebrate. Well, how do we know that God had regard for Jesus and his offering, which was Jesus himself? Well, because God raised him from the dead. That's Easter. Jesus as our king ruled over his enemies and ours, namely the world, the flesh, and the devil, unlike Cain. Well, you may ask, what does all this have to do with me? From this event, we learn that man has literally, from the beginning of time, sought for a way to appease his own guilty conscience. And this is ever since sin entered the picture through the fall of mankind from God's good grace. So just as Cain, mankind has presented the work of his hands as an offering to God, but God has had no regard for our offerings. That's because God will not accept the works of a sinful heart. Now, now, Christians easily get dismissed from the talks of systematic oppression to human beings made in the image of God because talking about Jesus as the remedy for the evil in both you and our hearts seems ineffective and irrelevant. Instead, by the work of our own hands, 
We have offered God more education. By education, we say, you know, this is going to create more social or economic opportunity for those who were previously denied it. But God has had no regard for this offering. It is true that um, because if a person's heart is evil, then more education is only going to make that person more sophisticated in their evil. D.L. Moody said, if a man is stealing nuts and bolts from a railway track, and in order to change him, you send him to college, at the end of his education, he's going to steal the whole railway track. You can educate evil people on how evil they are, but you cannot educate the evil out of the people. By the works of our own hands, we have offered God more governing, which we say will lead to better citizens and societies. But God has had no regard for that offering. It is true that government is necessary in order for us to maintain orderly societies, but our governors cannot make themselves better nor make the human beings that they govern be good to one another as evidenced by the most recent events. And our systems of checks and balance scream of the need for government to be governed too. By the works of our own hands, we point out the hypocrisy of other individuals. But God has had no regard for this offering. And that's because the ones pointing out the hypocrisy are guilty of the same hypocrisy. By the works of our own hands, we try to balance inequality. But God has had no regard for this offering because it is with inequality that we seek to balance inequality, claiming that they did it to us, so now we need to do it to them. By the works of our own hands, we riot and loot and hit capitalist America right where it hurts the most, in its own pocket. But God has had no regard for this offering because it has come at the expense of minority businesses and the very same businesses that all people alike benefit from in one way or another. Our society implodes as we jockey in a race to the bottom where the first place centarnished trophy is awarded to the person with the least dirtiest hands. When in reality, none of us have clean hands. No one except Jesus, the promised seed that we need. Here we are full circle to where we began. By the works of Jesus and his hands, the only man of a pure heart, God's justice was satisfied. Not the type of justice that comes with an indictment or a conviction or even ends in capital punishment. These are good. But if an indictment, a conviction, or the chair are what to you represent a balancing of the scales, then your idea of justice is way too narrow-minded, soft, and lenient. These are only temporary penalties. The works of Jesus' hands secure for us the eternal justice against the only being truly offended, and that is God. For offending God, we deserve death the grave, and hell. And Jesus took this horrible concoction, he mixed it up in a cup, and he chugged it so that you and I could do well and rule over the sin in our lives that causes the evil that we see and feel. Jesus is the only one who can change a sinner's heart. If you change the heart, you change the man. David prayed, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, we can revisit talks of reform through education and governance once our hearts have been changed. And my prayer is that through the past and recent events of history, that God can bring us as a nation to the end of our vanity in thinking that we are the measure in what is good. How much more do we need to witness before we see the error in the works of our own hands? Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray just as David that you give us clean hearts and pure hands. 
Only you can do this. You do it as you wish in your own ways and in your own time as you see fit. Lord, our nation needs to see that a man's wrath does not bring about your righteousness. Rather, our wrath is gasoline to the fire of our furious anger towards the evil we see in this fallen world. Lord, heal this nation from its self-inflicted wounds, from its inclination to debase human beings made in your image from the beginning of life all the way to the end. Lord, I also ask that you look upon the heavy hearted, that you heal your covenant people from their sickness and from the toll that COVID-19 has had on our health and finances. May you employ the unemployed, teach us to forgive the unforgivable and love the unlovable, because that is exactly what you did for us in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace a fool. I need thee every hour, say thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I that you enjoyed today's message and that you were able to benefit from it greatly. Now receive your benediction from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace. See you. 